you invited that one. Uh, if that comes from, he's an ex um, uh, Premier Grade referee here in Brisbane. Came from the land of the long white cloud, but we won't hold that against him. Does that mean he was all white Oh, he was definitely an all black trials. Uh, and he married a Maori princess. And he married, uh, that's right, he's married to a Maori princess, and he has. Uh, all his children have rights to the um, run to the throne in the country, something like that. So, uh, but nevertheless, he's, uh, this is uh, he's talking about now. This is uh, his uh, his business, his uh, passion, his life's work from now on. Is it not Pat? Pretty much for the last nine years. So I'll let him we'll do that in the break. Yeah, do that. So I'll take pressure off you. So without further ado, Pat, it's all yours, my boy. Thank you very much. Now, if we hit this button, I'll just show you a couple of buttons. So, if we hit that lecture two button, it does that, and if you go to hide, you get the white. Right. If you can show me that. That's awesome. Alright, before we get started, we have a warning. The information contained today probably goes completely against the grain of what you think you know about food and eating. So, for the next 45 to 60 minutes, I want you to forget about every single rule or thought process or what you think is healthy or what you think is unhealthy for the next 60 minutes and just simply open your mind to some possibilities that you could be doing the right thing after all. Even though 99 times out of 100, the medical fraternity will tell you you're doing wrong. One of these blokes is an athlete. Which one? Michael, Michael Owens. Owens. Who here thinks Michael Owens is the athlete? Nigel Owens. Nigel. Who here thinks Usain Bolt is the athlete? Okay. Store that for a moment. There's three things that we're going to talk about. Is that you, Pat? It is. So, the things that you can do that can affect your performance on the field, if we broke them down, could be training, eating, and sleep. My question to you is, which one's the most important? Who here thinks that training is probably the most important thing that you can do to affect your performance on the field? Who here thinks eating is probably the most important thing you can do? And who here thinks that sleeping is the most important? So, pretty much, we've got a third of you thinking... Training, a third thinking eating, and a third thinking sleep. Who has tried one of these diets? The low fat diet, the low carb diet, the high protein diet, and the living fucking detox. Who is just completely confused? Who doesn't really know? Who thinks they, they think they're doing but they get it wrong? Who gets confused and bombarded by all the 10,000 different messages there are? Uh, by the end of the, this presentation, I am hopefully going to be able to convince you that you are all athletes. So question number one was a trick. You are all athletes. That eating is far more important than training, but sleeping is far more important than eating. Uh, we're going to clarify the confusion of what to and when to eat, because what and when are actually as important as each other. Uh, we're going to sit down and map out a seven-day eating plan for you, and we're going to map that around your training program. So it would have been great if we had have overlaid Hoff's eating over his training program, because I've seen what he eats. And then when you layer it over his training program, it's almost perfect to the team. Uh, I'm then going to give away a one-hour one-on-one nutritional consult, which is worth $104 to somebody in the room, and everybody's going to get two free ebooks. Okay, but before we get started, I need to make sure that what I'm telling you actually works. So late last year, Matt O'Brien came to me. Actually, it was about uh, July, August. Uh, he came to me with a very big sceptical hat on because he had tried 
hundreds of nutritionists, dietitians, trainers, strength and conditioning coaches, and nothing seemed to work for him. So he, he told me that he was training daily, but he was struggling with low energy levels, that he didn't recover well, that his me measured fitness test only showed slight improvements. So he came and sat down with me, and we spent a couple of hours going through some things. And this is what I got him to do. Uh, I gave him a little bit of eating advice, which is exactly what I'm about to tell you now. I gave him some grocery planning tools, because planning was probably one of the areas that he was weak in. But we more importantly looked at some of the effects of how his eating was impacting on his recovery and his training. As a result of implementing some of the things that I gave him, he lost 5 kilograms of body fat in 11 weeks. Now, if you've seen Matt without a shirt on, you wouldn't believe he actually had 5 kilos of body fat to lose. So for someone who's only 74 kilos, to lose 5 kilos of body fat was quite remarkable. He's finding now that he can handle the higher training loads that he used to struggle with in the past. But the most important thing that he's finding is that he's always had poor yo-yo scores. He says that's probably one of his biggest bugbears is he can never get higher than 16 or 17. And he's been able to achieve his highest yo-yo score ever. And just in case you were wondering, they are both athletes. So it was a trick question. Even Nigel. <laughs> Speaking of athletes, once again, the New Zealand Sevens team have won yet another tournament. Is that just information purposes? <laughs> <laughs> yes, the, the, the point of the purpose is, all of these people are athletes. If you've ever seen them do the haka with their shirt off, you would understand that they're athletes. But China told me an interesting story yesterday, which I'm going to ask her to tell you all now. China? Um, I was talking with a couple of guys that were on the World Series with this team, and um, one of them mentioned something that happened. It was a really intense environment in Vegas, and there was a team, there was meetings everywhere, and all the referees were there, all the coaches were there, and there was lunch laid out. And, I mean, it was a lunch that we see, um, you know, on the Gold Coast 7. It's like, great lunch. They did really well. But then there was a table with, like, cupcakes and things. And the Kiwi coach walked right up to the table and just grabbed the cupcakes and, like, threw them across the room and just start was, I mean, it was very extreme, but was starting to yell, like, they're athletes here. They shouldn't be eating this rubbish. Like, why are you even serving it? And, yeah, it was pretty intense, I don't think. People appreciated it, but yeah, what he said was. And, and it, was, it was ironic when China told me the story yesterday that one of the key reasons why this team succeeds so well is not because of the performance on the field by their athletes. It's not even probably because they sit in ice bars and those sorts of things. But the one thing that Gordon Titchens is absolutely known for on the Seventh Circuit this is analness to his athletes eating the right food. Absolutely, without a doubt, on top of his gut-busting, vomit-causing, you know, spewing in the corners. In the old days, we the seven used to be here in Brisbane, and the referees used to train at West. And a couple of, I think, the, the Wednesday before leading up to a tournament, we all rocked up to West's one day, and uh, these guys were just finishing off the session. Uh, Eric Rush was still in the team. We were all just pulling up, and they were doing those things called Hemi Mullers. Does everybody know what a Hemi Muller is? You run across the goal line, you run diagonal to the halfway, you run across the halfway, and then you run diagonal back to the goal line. So it's the big X. So Eric Rush is running these things. Now, at the time, he was already in his very high 30s, about 36, 37. So he's running, a, he's running his squad through their cool down. This is at the end of their training session. And we're all rocking up as referees getting ready for us. So we're sitting there watching. And he's, they've run two or three. And then he has just gone off his rocker with every single profanity and swear word that you could possibly imagine. Because he is 37 years of age, leading 19, 20-year-olds around these hemi -mons. 
So the next five heavy mullahs, I guarantee you that he was coming last. Those are the sorts of things that Hoff was allowing to in terms of commitment and sacrifice. <coughs> okay, so I, I need to convince you that sleeping is more important than eating and eating is more important than training. And I've got a very narrow reason why. It all comes down to two things, time and maths. So, what do I mean by time and maths? Well, let's have a look. How many hours in a week? 168. How much time during the week do you spend sleeping, eating, and training? So while you're thinking about it, let's work it out. The average adult needs around six to nine hours of sleep per night. Multiply that by seven nights a week, and you get between 42 and 63 hours a week spent sleeping. If you're having between three and five meals a day, and you spend about 15 to 30 minutes eating and preparing your food, over a seven day period, you're spending between eight and 17 hours a week just eating. So you can see now, sleeping takes up a bigger chunk than eating does. And for anybody who's actually got a training plan mapped out, if you're doing two weight sessions a week, two cardio sessions a week, and two stretching or recovery type sessions a week, the reality is your training week only is six hours. So if you do the math, sleeping, 42 to 63 hours, eating, 8 to 17, training, 6. Do you now understand now why I say that sleeping is more important than eating, but eating is more important than training? And it gets even more simpler than that given that some of you now have access to three or four structured training sessions a week, you don't even have to think of training, you just have to turn up. How easy is training now? It is front. At least with the eating bit, you've got to do a bit of effort. And the sleeping, well, you've got to turn the computer off at 6 o'clock at night and get away from an LED screen so it stops firing up a hormone that's been secreted from the pituitary gland that's trying to wake you up because it thinks the sun's coming up in the morning. Put the most effort into performing tasks that you do the most of. So sleeping comes first, eating comes second, training is a way distant third. Likewise on the rugby field, put the most effort into the tasks that you perform the most often. There are far more tackle contests in a game than there are scrums, lineouts, and kickoffs. So obviously it makes perfect sense then to focus your efforts on getting the big picture things right. Have you noticed I've called it eating? The, the whole, the whole present, presentation is called eating for reps. Why is it not called diet or nutrition? Because you don't want it to be a diet, it's got to be a lifestyle. Exactly. So what is a diet? Well, a diet has a start. I'm going to start this diet on Monday. Have you ever noticed everybody starts things on a Monday? And I'm going to finish that diet when I've lost 10 kilos. So we want to get rid of the words diet or nutrition out of your vocabulary. Fat people. I deal with fat people every single day. Fat people diet, exercise and rest. They have a start and a finish. Athletes, on the other hand, eat, train, eat, recover, repeat. Eat, train, eat, recover, repeat. You have a pre-season, an in-season, and an off-season. Which basically means there is no start and finish. You only transition from one phase to the next. So what are we at at the moment? Pre-season. Pre then when the season kicks off, what will we be in? In season. Then at the end of the season, we'll be in? Off season. Does that mean that we stop what we're doing? Do we stop eating well? Do we stop training? We might change what we're doing to create some variety, but you don't just say, oh, that's it, I'm done. 
I'm going to just go back to eating Maccas three times a day. But you find people that I work with in the real world, that's their mentality. Right, oh, I've lost those 10 kilos, I'll go back to eating Maccas three times a day. So I, I suppose probably what I'm trying to really emphasise is, and I've heard every single coach and Hoff and everybody's used it, the word starts with A, you are now an athlete. Get out of the mindset of being a person who diets and trains. You're an athlete. All right. Probably what you're most looking forward to is what to eat. And I don't have the magic bullet, I'm afraid. I don't have the answer. Because there is no such thing as a one-size-fits-all. Does anybody know who this guy is? His name's Ansel Keys. Okay, so Ansel Keys was the guy that did a massive mega analysis data study in the early 50s, which continued on until the late 1960s, 70s. And this graph here has across the bottom is the percent of calories that nations derived in their daily calorie from fat. And up the left-hand side, my laser beam doesn't really work, but up the left-hand side was the number of deaths per thousand from cardiovascular disease. So here we have six countries, Japan, Italy, England and Wales, Australia, Canada and the US. And if you look at that graph, you know, you don't have to be a rocket science to come to the conclusion that the more fat you eat, the higher your risk of cardiovascular disease. Does that picture leap out at you? Does that say that's exactly what that graph looks like? Who here can look at that graph and say, obviously the more fat calories you eat, the higher risk of cardiovascular disease. Is that clear? Yeah. yeah. Okay. And it was called the seven country study because he ultimately used another country, New Zealand. Oh, and here's the irony. He actually had data from 22 countries. But not all of the countries fitted the picture that he wanted to paint. So he didn't include them in the seven country study. And to give you an example, there's a country out here, number 19, which is Sweden. 40% of their diet is derived from fat. Yet, they were only up to around the 3,000 deaths of cardiovascular disease. So when you look at those two graphs together, you know, I'm not the brightest spark in the, in the shed, but clearly there doesn't appear to be a correlation between fat consumption and cardiovascular disease. But Ansel Keys was an American whose studies were funded by the grain industry. As a result of his paper, we ended up with this. Remove fat from your diet to reduce the risk of cardiovascular disease. And look what happened to the food pyramid. All of a sudden we're now eating cereals and grains and breads. Buy the gazillion loads. Thanks to Mr. Hansel Kiss. Which looks something like that now. So the food pyramid was trying to encourage everybody that was living in a country that had high levels of cardiovascular disease to eat like this. So if this was your plate, your plate would have 70% carbohydrates, 20% proteins, and 10% fat. Which is all very well and good if you do well eating like this. So what happened from 1971 to 2009. Low fat actually became high sugar, because when you take fat out of a food, it tastes bland. So the only way you can get people to eat it is you've got to add some flavourings, and given that the grain industry was driving this thing, they added sugar to everything. President Nixon, who wanted one of his main roles in his presidency was to make food cheap, so he created a whole industry called fast food, and he made fast food cheap. 
Food manufacturers prey on our gullibility by putting cheap foods at checkouts. Why are there chocolates and lollies at every single checkout? We are surrounded with cheap junk food at the checkouts now, and as a result, we are sicker and fatter than ever in human history. Those people now who are about to enter into relationships and have children, your children will be the first species of human that will be sicker and not live as long as their parents. Here is a gorgeous bunch of people. Well, one bloke is gorgeous, the rest of you are just average. So, let's see if we can characterise all of these people. And one of them decided to go to the toilet at the wrong time and missed out on the photo. <laughs> so let's break this group into their various characteristics. What have we got? Male, female. Male, female. What else? Short fat. Well, you have short fat, but we've got different people, different races. Age. Age. Under 20 and over 50s. And physique. Yep. And we've got people who sit behind a computer all day to those that work active physical lives. Could you imagine trying to write a meal plan that fitted all those categories? We are all different. So for millions of years, we lived on this earth reasonably healthy, except we were battling with other animals that were killing us. And the reality is, we literally evolved to eat whatever we could get our hands on. But not every subspecies ate the same macronutrient ratio, simply because the food wasn't available. Fast forward to the 21st century, Western civilizations now live in urban metropolitan centres. We have unprecedented access to large amounts of food, like never before. The most important change is we now eat cheap, and I call them food-like substances, because they're not really food, that never existed 200 years ago. <coughs> Soft drinks, energy drinks, sports drinks, chips, lollies, cakes, biscuits, just to name a few. The simple fact of the matter is we have not yet evolved to eat the rubbish that we're eating today. So what's the answer for you? What do you eat? What ratio of macronutrients should you be eating? Oops, that's probably a premature. Just problem in my life. <laughs> <laughs> Metabolic typing. There are three types of people in the world. A protein type, a mixed type, and a carb type. Now, who's done the, who's, pro, who's metabolic typing? Just to me, A in the ring? Oh, yeah, we. All right, so. Without any knowledge of what I'm talking about here, who can guess, and you two can keep quiet, what type I am? Protein. Mixed. Protein mixed. Anyone else protein? Who's been watching me eat over the last two days? Yeah, you're it's all protein. Protein, protein, protein. Um, when I first arrived in Australia in 1999, I came with a couple of medical conditions. Type 2 diabetes and high blood pressure. Both were diagnosed in my early 20s as a result of an occupational hazard that I had. Uh, for those of you who don't know, I had my throat cut when I was... 19 or 20 years of age, uh, and you know, got the 27 stitches scarred at root. But what happened was, I was diagnosed with hypertensive and type 2, borderline type 2 diabetic at 19. So, for the next 20 odd years, I battled with type 2 diabetes and high blood pressure through medication, and was told by my cardiologist that I would be medicated for the rest of my life. I arrived in Australia, got on the watch squad which allowed me to have access to our ARU trainer, who back in those days was Coley and Yummy and Hinto, who was a guy by the name of Nate. And uh, I was instructed, as a result of doing some tests, that I had to increase my consumption of grains and cereals. I had to eat more carbs, basically. So I became eating like a carbo type. 
and I struggled to lose some weight. My type 2 diabetes got so bad that they just kept increasing the medication. And I went on to the blood pressure medication tablet that had the diuretic included, which was the one that Shane Warne took, which got him in trouble with the, the SAR. So the medication that I was taking was Avapro HCT, and I was taking the biggest pill that you could possibly get. And, but nothing was working. So we fast forward, I'm now eating a protein type. So I now eat literally 50% of my meals in our protein. I haven't had to take blood pressure medication. I now no longer have type 2 diabetes. Uh, in fact, they, my cardiologist can't believe the numbers. And he, he still shudders whenever I walk into his studio with the amount of meat that I'm eating. He shakes his head. But he says, well, the numbers don't lie. Okay. For those of you who haven't done this, we just this question here that I'm about to give you is going to work out for you what your metabolic type is. Just take one and pass one. There's only twenty, so we'll go with all the first first. Um, you two don't have to work because I'll really know where you are. I'll get it with you. Okay, what would type we call it? Okay, right. We'll talk about that in a minute. I'll do it Well, we'll uh, we just make sure we're done. Are we doing it now? Yes. So quickly do this now. It'll take you two to five minutes. If you don't know the answer, has it a guess? Remember, it's not a test. It's a questionnaire. So what does that mean? There's no right or wrong answer. It's only what's right for you. What if you don't know? If you don't know, then you don't know. All we're really looking for is how many option A answers you get and how many option B answers you get. There's only two options. Okay. So all you're really looking for is how many A answers have you got and how many B answers. Okay, protein types. How many of you have got way more A answers than B? Like heaps more, like six or seven or eight. Five, six, seven, eight. All right. Protein types. Well, blah, 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 blah. many protein types share similar characteristics, however, this does not mean that you are like everyone else in your category. Nonetheless, here are some typical tendencies that you may have common with other protein types. Protein types tend to have strong appetites to the point of being ravenously hungry a great deal of the time. Right. You may feel the need to eat frequently, though you are also likely to have a hard time feeling satisfied. In addition, you probably have a tendency to overeat, sometimes even stuffing yourself to bursting point only to find you're still hungry. Protein types typically gravitate towards rich, fatty, salty foods. However, if you stray too far from these heavier foods and consume too many carbs, you quickly find yourself craving sugar. In fact, the more carbs you eat, the stronger your cravings, and as a result, your energy levels plummet and you feel nervous and jittery. Your many attempts at low-calorie diets have failed dismally, and your weight substantially ballooned. Am I resonating with the protein guys in the room? Yeah, yeah absolutely. Uh, so those of you who had more B answers than A, just the one. I'm old. No, no, no. It's not. I'll tell you why I'm not. Carbotypes. Relatively weak appetites. For carbotypes, a little food can go a long way. You may eat three squares a day, but often meals won't be large, and you may even be satisfied with two meals or even smaller snacks. You have a high tolerance for sweets. Unless you're hyperglycemic, your metabolism copes very well with sweets. It's both a blessing and a curse, because chances are you reach for them when you need a quick shot of energy. 3.30 p.m. itis. And if you're overdo them, your other medical problems like insulin resistance, diabetes, hypoglycemia occur. Your problems with weight management, you're quite often lean, struggle to gain muscle, but put on fat really easy. Uh, how are we? We're close to the mark there with you. How diabetes, that's right. Yeah. Uh, and those of you who haven't got a real gap, there are one or two questions either side. So you're a mixed type. Welcome to the world of eating right for the mixed type. Uh, 
Most of us have been slaves to our food, however, now the tables have turned. Uh, you recognize your metabolic and blah, 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 blah. Okay, so mixed type people are lucky you get to eat from both charts. What does it mean? Well, simply mixed type people, you can eat protein at every meal, get a good mix of protein type foods and carb type foods, snack as needed, consider dairy individually, use grains in moderation. So if you have a look at those three pie charts, how many of you are actually eating relative to the percentages that you are? And how many of you now have, have to make some modifications or drastic changes? So how many carb types in the room? Just the one. This is the standard food pyramid. According to Western Medicine, the entire population of Australia ought to be eating like that. No wonder we have such an obesity epidemic. 